I want to <clears throat> try to capture in a, an abbreviated way 20 chapters of Scripture. <laughs> okay. And it's in the book of Genesis. Um, and my wife is doing children's church uh, again today, so we will get out on time. <laughs> <clears throat> here's what I want to look at there is a large section of Genesis that gives us a lot of history on a lot of things but in it in the sweep of all of these chapters that I want to try to condense. There is what I want to call God's conquest of a human heart. Really, that's what the entire plan of salvation is all about. It's what, that's what biblical world history is all about. God calling back to himself the race he created that estranged themselves from him by rebellion. All the rest of the history after Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve eating of the tree, is really God's efforts to conquer and draw back, redeem, restore every single human being. And in the sweep of these chapters, we see that. I also <clears throat> want you to realize that these chapters... And not just these 20, but specifically um, probably 12 of Genesis through 32 um, are by no means um, the only chapters we get this. But that whole section is a huge foundation for the New Testament. If we realize the book of Genesis and the history of Israel, um, the 12 sons of Jacob and the tribes and the Egyptian um, captivity and all this is an amazing foundation for Paul, especially in the New Testament. If you recall Stephen, when before he was stoned and he was before the Sanhedrin giving his defense, he merely repeated most of what I'll say today, the, the section of history. It is a huge springboard for the New Testament. That's why it's important that we know it and know the details as much as we can. Starts with Abraham. God chose to start a new nation, really, raise up a new nation who would be his people. And that nation, the reason he did that, that nation would be the vehicle through which he would first give us his word, the prophets, the scriptures. Then, that was but a forerunner giving the scripture to Israel's chief purpose, the channel through which God would send his only begotten son to redeem the entire world, to die on behalf of sinners. This new race, this new country, a new nation, was to be that vehicle, God's chosen people, through whom he would then choose all the world. Now, so he selected Abraham. Abraham, we're told, was of two nations, really, two peoples, one Amorite, one Syrian. Okay, So there was nothing special um, about 
Abraham as far as bloodlines. But God separated him to make a new bloodline through whom he would send his own son and through whom he would receive a physical body of a Jew to die for the entire human race. God selected Abraham, called him from Ur of the Chaldees, which is in southern Iraq, and told him, head west. He followed the Euphrates and the Tigris, and that's what was called the Fertile Crescent, um, ancient, ancient history. And he traveled to a place called Haran, he, his father, his brother, his wife, that whole clan, traveled to a city called Haran. They settled there. There Abraham's father died. Terah was his name. And then God spoke to Abraham specifically and said, leave your household, leave your relatives, and go into the land of Canaan which was about 400 miles, 450 miles south, Palestine, as we know it today. So Abraham left on that journey and came in to the land of Canaan. God then promised him, I will give you all of this land, give it to you and your descendants. He kept talking to Abraham about descendants. Abraham's moment of trusting in God in a new and deeper and different way was in 15, chapter 15, where God brought Abraham out and showed him all of the stars. That was before what we call light pollution, and it was in the desert at night. And so we can only imagine the stars that Abraham saw. And God brought him out and said, look at all those. That's how many descendants I'm going to give you. Abraham, now here was the problem. Abraham didn't have any descendants. And by this time, he's getting up in years. And he keeps getting up in years. And to shorten the story, he comes to where he's 99. And his wife at the time is 89. And God is still talking to him about all your descendants. We're told that Abraham didn't stagger through unbelief, but he reasonably and reverently questioned, Lord, you know, you keep telling me that I'm going to have children, and I don't have any. He had arranged through Sarah's suggestion, to marry as a sub-wife, Sarah's maiden, had Ishmael by her and figured, okay, it's going to be Ishmael, that this promise will be, through him, that'll be fulfilled. God kept saying, no, I've got a son for you. It's not Ishmael. And we know all that went on with Abraham's testing there. And finally, when Abraham's 100 and Sarah is 90, God waited until it was impossible, then he did it. Pretty typical. Now, that waiting is hard. I have a book, I think I've mentioned it, I've been a long time since I read it, in my library, that the title is, God's Never Ever Failed Me. And then in parentheses, it says, but he has scared the daylights out of me three or four times. <laughs> he kept telling Abraham, and Abraham kept steady. But it wasn't until Abraham was a hundred, when you can't have children. And it says with Sarah, the time was gone when she could have children. Okay, then God says, all right, now I'm going to do it. That tells us a little something about God. They had their son Isaac. 
God said through Isaac is who I will perform all the promises I've given you, including I'll bless every nation on earth through Isaac. Now, I don't know if Abraham knew at that point what that meant, but we know now that it meant I'm sending the Savior through that line, through Isaac. Isaac gets married at 40, marries Rebekah. By the time he is 60, they don't have children. And so Isaac prays, beseeches God. God said, I'll take care of it. And Rachel becomes pregnant and is discovered. She's in difficulty health-wise. And she goes and prays and says, Lord, what, what, what's the deal here? And God says, there are two nations in your womb. And you, you're going to have twins. And among other things, God told Rebecca, you've got to keep this in the back of your head, you're going to have two sons and two nations, and the younger one will rule over the older one. So, she has Esau first, and then Jacob, immediately after. So immediately after, that when Jacob is born, he is grabbing Esau's heel. They named Esau Esau because he was red, and it says hairy. Jacob, this, they were not identical twins. Jacob said later, was he was a smooth-skinned person. Okay, They named Esau Esau because it means red. It's kind of a, almost a nickname. Red because of how he looked. They called Jacob Jacob because he grabbed his brother's heel. And the word Jacob literally means supplanter. Supplanter is someone who by deceit or by force takes another's place. That's what it literally means. I assume somebody else's position through deceit or maybe force. And so he got tagged with that name. The Bible all through the remainder. Even the minor prophets, Hosea talks a lot about Jacob grabbing Esau's heel. It comes up many times. So these two boys grow up. And I think we have an example of some bad parenting. Isaac loved Esau more than Jacob. Rebekah loved Jacob more than Esau. Remember that Rebekah remembered what God told her. The younger, who she preferred, Jacob, is going to rule over the older. That wasn't the way things are done. Because now we have a concept that plays into all this. And that is the birthright and the blessing. The birthright always went to the firstborn, usually. There was freedom on the part of the father to vacate the birthright to the firstborn if the firstborn was a rat. Okay? You could, you know, you could reschedule things. But generally... The birthright went to the firstborn. That meant head of the clan, and in a religious sense, spiritual priest, really, to the clan. And third, a double portion of the inheritance from the father. In this case, Esau was scheduled to be head of the clan. He would have been the high priest. He also would have gotten two-thirds of Isaac's um, a state, Jacob would have gotten one-third. Okay? So they grow up. Very different. Jacob is a cattle breeder. He's a farmer more. Uh, uh, Esau was a man, it says, of the field. He hunted. He was an outdoors guy. And that's another reason Isaac loved him more, because he would hunt and fix him great dishes of meat. And so Isaac thought that was great. So he liked him better. 
And I think Jacob was more in the village, uh, in the camp, um, and so was closer with his mother. One day Esau comes home from hunting. He claims, like we'll all say, the phrase we'll use, I'm starving to death. Now everyone here has used that term and not one person here has been really starving to death or has finally died trying to get to a restaurant or the refrigerator. Why well, Esau comes in Jacob is stirring, he's making a pot of stew. And Esau says, I'm starving to death. Give me some of that, give me a bowl of that soup. Jacob, being the supplanter that he is, is ever on the alert. He never misses a chance, ever. And he saw it. I'll give you some soup, give you a bowl of soup if you're that hungry, only if you sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm ready to die, which was nonsense. I'm ready to die. He said, what good's a birthright do to me if if I die? i got to have that soup. So, He traded away his birthright. The Bible later on says, Hebrews, says Esau was profane. The word profane means to consider something sacred as non-sacred. To be trivial about spiritual things. To be superficial about religious things and deep, serious spiritual issues. It's not... You know, uh, 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 just a ring-tailed cusser. That, that's, we use a profanity. The word profane means to treat as common something that's sacred. And so the Bible rightly, in the original use of that word, says Esau was profane. He didn't pay attention. He didn't care. The birthright was the right to be the high priest of the family, the right to lead the clan, to keep them in the worship of Yahweh, the Lord. Hey, he didn't care. That seems to typify his personality. There are people like that. They just never seem to ever have a serious thought in their heads. Esau was like that. So it says he ate and he drank And he got up and he walked away. And the scripture here in Genesis said, so he despised his birthright, thought nothing of it. Now that plays in after a while. I don't know. I suppose the parents heard about it. But Isaac and Esau, or or Jacob and Esau knew about it, this arrangement. They go along for a while, a number of years, And Isaac, they think, is drawn close to death. Isaac has also lost his eyesight due to age. He's blind. He thinks he's going to die. Everybody else thinks he's going to die. So then a second major ritual in Israel and Jewish culture, the blessing, the birthright gave you double inheritance, right of leadership of the clan, but it also entitled you later to the blessing. The blessing was um, a prophetic pronouncement that God inspired to the Father regarding the future of his children. And it was binding, meaning if God inspired the Father to say, such and such will be your lot in life and you will reign over this and you'll conquer that. And you'll... It happened. So it, and it was not reversible. So Jacob, now remember, Rebecca had a word from God, Jacob's going to be the head, not Esau. Well, Jacob had already gotten the birthright and now Isaac thinking he's on the verge of death, 
calls Esau and says, go hunt, thick savory meat for me like I, you know I like. I'm near death. I'm going to pronounce the blessing on you. That was a pinnacle ritual. Rebecca overhears Isaac saying that to Esau. She grabs Jacob and she says, we got to move fast. Your father thinks that he's ready to die and he's going to give the blessing to Esau. Now the thing I wonder if she knew about the birthright being traded is because really what Esau did, and he regarded it to nothing, but Esau traded away his right to the blessing by trading away the birthright. So it was really two things he had no regard for. The birthright itself and what it also qualified him for, which was the blessing. And so Esau goes out and he's, I'll get the blessing, I guess. So he goes hunting. Meanwhile, Rebecca says, get me a couple little goats. I know how to fix meat so it's, it seems like um, game from the field. And then you put on Esau's clothes and Jacob stops her and he says, here's what's interesting. Jacob, whose name means deceiver, supplanter, he said, Mom, I can't do that. I'll look like I'm a deceiver. <laughs> yeah, you will. Because you are. Rebecca says, I'll take care of it. <clears throat> he says, well, hey, I'm smooth skinned. He's hairy. My father will feel my hands and I'll be found out as a deceiver. She says, don't worry about it. She takes the skins of the goats and, and she puts those on the back of his hands, the back of his neck, puts Esau's clothes on him, fixes the food. He comes in and he says, my father, here's, here's the meal that we're going to eat together and then you're going to give me the blessing. Isaac says, who is this? Well, he says, I'm your son I, Esau. And, Jay, and Isaac makes a great statement, which I think is also a lifetime. I've heard it used a thousand times over my life. Isaac says, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands, because he touched his hands and felt them rough and hairy, the hands are the hands of Esau. Something ain't right here. I've heard that used for people who talk like Christians and say they are, but don't act like it. The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Something isn't adding up here. He says, come over. Let me hug you. I, I don't know what Jacob was thinking. He had, had to be scared to death. Isaac hugs him. Smells the field, he said on the clothes of Esau that he was wearing. And he said, ah, oh, I know this is easy. It's the smell of the field. And, and so he gives him the blessing. And he says, you'll rule over your brother, thinking it's Esau. You'll rule over your brother, the do of the ground and all kinds of stuff. And then he gives the specific Jewish blessing from God to Abraham to Isaac and eventually from Jacob to everyone else. And it was this. In you and in your children will all the tribes of the earth be blessed. That's Christ. And Isaac pronounces that blessing to Jacob. Jacob gets out of the tent scarcely and in comes Esau. And of course, Isaac said, who are you? He said, I'm your son Esau. What's the problem here? And Isaac tells him what has just taken place. Esau goes crazy. He's, he's bawling and carrying on. And here's the thing. He, he wanted the blessing. And in a sense, he wanted God's favor and he wanted the ultimate blessing. He wanted heaven when he had already traded away his birthright. He didn't care if he was born of God. So you're not going to get the blessing. Hebrews said that. Hebrews said, because Esau 
was profane. He didn't care about spiritual things. Then don't be looking to go to heaven. Hebrews says he could not obtain the blessing, referring to Esau, though he sought it with tears. And here's the word there, and it gets misinterpreted, so I'll just throw this in quick. This is free. It says in the scripture, he could find no place, Esau, could find no place of repentance, though he sought it earnestly with tears. So some interpret that Esau could never have found, God wouldn't forgive him. That isn't what that's talking about at all. Esau was seeking repentance, turning on the part of Isaac. He was trying to talk his dad into giving him the blessing when he traded away the right to it. And somebody else had it. So the repentance then that Esau was seeking was not that he could ask forgiveness, but that Isaac would change his mind. And Isaac said, I can't. It's over. You blew it. So then Isaac, when he re- or Esau, when he realizes he's cooked, he comforted himself, it said, by letting everybody know I'm laying low till my dad dies and then I'm going to kill Jacob. So Rebecca cooks up a scheme and she goes to Isaac and says, let's send Jacob away because we don't want him marrying one of these Canaanite women like Esau did. Because they, they, she said, I'm weary of my life because of these daughter-in-laws that I got. I'm not going to get into any of that. And so they said, let's send him away. And notice, here's what Rebecca said to Jacob. Jacob said, we're going to send you away for a while. And in the meantime, Esau's anger will cool off for what you did to him. (laughs) It was her idea. I didn't have anything to do with it. There's nothing new under the sun. I didn't do it. You did it to your brother. She cooked the whole thing up. Suddenly, I didn't have anything to do with it. So Isaac sends Jacob off. Jacob heads north to Haran, back to where Abraham originally had come. 450 mile trip. And he comes to a place called Luz. We don't know when, maybe early on in his trip. It was only about 50 miles from where Jacob was living at the time in Beersheba, southern Judah, southern Palestine. So maybe it's a couple days, I don't know. But he's a couple days into the journey. He comes to a place called Luz. And he's caught, which you don't, didn't want to do in those days, outside of a safe city. He's out in the open. He's not only wild animals, but also bandits. So he fixes up some kind of a little shelter for himself. I think he puts up some stones, as best we can tell. And he goes to sleep there. He has the dream that we refer to, Jacob's dream, of the ladder going clear to heaven. Angels ascending and descending on it. Jesus in the New Testament, says, I'm that ladder. You will see, he said to Nathanael when he called him as a disciple, you'll see the Son of Man and angels descending and ascending on him. Meaning, Jesus is the ladder to heaven. He's the connection between earth and heaven. Jacob has that dream and he wakes up in the morning and he said, This is the gate of heaven. And he makes a great statement. God's here. I never even knew it. I didn't even realize it. But God's here. He goes on his trip. I'll cut some of this out. He gets to Haran. And here's God's working. He prayed. They sent him to get a wife. He prayed that he would be able to find his, 
family, his relatives. And remember this, what proofs he got that he, they are his relatives. They don't have social media. They don't have anything. Maybe he had a clay tablet with his birth record. I don't know. But there's no way. How does, how does the family know that he's not an imposter? Well, he goes, he goes to the well. He meets Rachel, who's shepherding sheep. And he asks the shepherds all around waiting to open up the well and water the sheep. Is Laban my uncle, my mom's brother? Does he live around here? Is he still living? Is the family still here? They said, yeah. In fact, there's his daughter right there coming with his sheep. He greets her. She runs back, tells Laban, Rebecca's boy is here. Laban comes running to him, invites him into the house. He stays with him for a month, feeding him and, you know, keep him just there, you know, celebrating or whatever. And finally Laban says, you know, you're, since you're flesh and blood, uh, I can't use your wages for nothing. I'm going to pay you. What, do you. what do you want? Jacob didn't know it. But if Jacob was a deceiver, he met the guy that in Webster's Dictionary had his picture when you looked up deceiver. Laban. Laban made deceit and made the deceiver Jacob look like a Sunday school choir boy. Laban was something else. God sent the deceiver, the supplanter Jacob, to a real one. To make a long story short, he says, I'll, here's my wages I want. I'll work for you for seven years so I can marry Rachel. Laban doesn't really say yes. Well, it'd be better to give her to you than to somebody else. I'd have never gone on that kind of an answer. But it was not nailed down. It said he served seven years like it was nothing. Remember, they didn't have LED Al Gore light bulbs then. It's dark. They have a wedding. They go into the honeymoon tent, okay? Unknown to Jacob. Laban, who had two daughters, Rachel, who it says was beautiful, and Leah, I don't know the story here, but the only thing it says she was weak-eyed. I don't know what that means. I don't know. But it's not too complimentary. He takes Leah, covered with a veil, the whole business, into a totally black, dark tent. And when the sun comes up in the morning, Jacob realizes, this isn't Rachel. Rachel. He had a chat with Laban shortly after that. What have you done to me? Laban said, well, he said, around here the culture is you never marry off the older daughter um, or the younger daughter before the older daughter. I don't know if that was true or not, but the bottom line was you got dowry from your daughters. He wasn't going to get any probably from Leah because she was weak-eyed. Okay, who's going to want to marry her and who's going to give more than a couple of cows to Laban? So he cooks up this deal. He gets rid of Leah, who he thought he probably could never get a dowry on. Then he says to Jacob, he said, just fulfill, ful fulfill her week. You only, had to you only had to go one week before you could marry another one. He said, okay, give Leah a week. And then he says, we'll give you Rachel who you'll work for for another seven years. That's 14. What's he do? Well, he's probably feeling a little like Esau then. And so he works another seven years, has children, works six more years, during which Laban, it says, Jacob said, changed his wages ten times. Just messed with him. For 20 years, he was under the heel of a guy that was like he was. Finally, he leaves. He heads back the long trip back to Canaan. And 
won't go into all the story of how he got out of there and Laban nearly kept him from leaving. But they get down into Palestine and he's ready to cross the Jordan River. And he's worried about his brother. It's been 20 years, but he knows Esau said, I'm going to kill you. And so he decides, i got to send a bunch of gifts and a bunch of cows and stuff. And so he gets all, by now Jacob is very wealthy. It gives the list of the donkeys, the camels, the cattle, the goats, all this stuff he's got. Maid servants, men servants, he's got a huge household. Very wealthy. And he can spare a lot. He sends an arrangement of over 250 different livestock. He puts them in little groups and space maybe a mile and he sends a servant and, and you know, go meet Esau and help him, you know, tell him these are gifts from Jacob. Well, the first servant that meets Esau, he roars back to Jacob and says, hey, Esau's coming to meet you, but he's got 400 men with him. Now, that doesn't sound too good. Nobody brings 400 men, no women, no kids. 400 men? That's an army. That's not good. Jacob is absolutely, he's shot. And he goes to prayer. That'll make a prayer out of you. He goes to prayer. He says, oh God, he said, I'm afraid that Esau will kill the kids and the mothers. And he attributes some pretty bad things to Esau. And so he sends all these gifts. And then he ends up, the day's gone now, sundown. He sends his wives and all of his 12 kids over this little brook, and he's by himself. And I don't have the time, I wish I had, but it said, there wrestled a man with Jacob. And this man we know now as we look back, I'm confident it was Christ Jesus in what we call pre-incarnate form before the human form he took when he came here. But it was a, a man, a real person. Wrestled with him, says, till the break of day. And a, the whole wrestling starts out, it seems, with Jacob prevailing. Because it says the angel couldn't prevail, or didn't. Let Jacob try to coerce the angel into blessing him and saving him from Esau. And finally, when it says the angel didn't prevail over him, the angel, it says, smote Jacob on the hip. And I don't know what exactly that did to him, but it, it wasn't good. And so Jacob turned from a fighter to a, a failure who was hanging on. No longer was he trying to beat the angel. He's just hanging on. And he's saying, please bless me, please bless me, please help me. No longer is he trying to overpower. He's now in the position of helplessness where God is trying to get every last one of us. And hanging on, he said, bless me. And then the angel says to him, ah, you could preach on this longer than you want to hear. What's the price of, for God's blessing? What's the price for God to pour out his heart into our heart? What's the price the angel named it. He said, what's your name? What in the world's that got to do with him? This guy's hanging on to the angel. Please bless me. Please bless me. Tell me what your name is. Like he doesn't know his name? Well, he knows his name. What's your name? Jacob. Supplanter. Deceiver. Trickster. 
someone who goes along behind and grabs you by the heel and trips you up. The angel immediately said, we won't call you Jacob anymore, but now your new name is Israel, which is Prince of God. Because you've, here's the interesting thing. The angel says, you've prevailed. <laughs> what? He quit. He gave up. That's when you win. He prevailed. He said, you've, you've won. Because you quit. You gave up. He won't, we won't call you Jacob anymore. Yes, he's referred to Scripture at times as Jacob. But what happened there? God changed his heart. Changed his nature. He's no longer a deceiver. A supplanter. A self, uh, selfish worker for his own ends. He's Israel. Now, let me just give a couple of applications here to that story. He goes on, he meets Esau, it doesn't turn out bad at all. Um, because frankly, Esau probably had shaped up a little bit in 20 years. Um, and things were fine. But there's some application here. God's goal is to get every one of us to where we say, you're God, I'm not. Thy will be done. I don't care what it is. I don't care. I so trust you and so acknowledge that you own me that I get out of the way, quit making demands, quit trying to work for my own ends. Don't have time to go into this, but God told Rebecca, the younger will rule over the elder. She wouldn't leave it alone. Even though it was the will of God, she figured, I'm going to do it. I know how to get it done. No, just leave it alone. There would have been some way that God still made Jacob ruler over Esau without all of this stuff. So Jacob goes on, and Jacob, God, is, God blesses him, and we see the blessing that he obtained was due to coming to that place. God's aim with every single one of us is down on our knees begging him. That makes sense? That's where he wants every one of us. I'm not running this show. You are. I'm utterly submitting to you and you alone. We see God's Marvelous love, his marvelous patience. We need to see, we remember, this was not the day where you died at 70, okay, or 80, or whatever. Jacob lived to be 147, which he considered nothing because his dad and his grandpa had lived 175. Jacob was probably, the estimate is, it's very likely when he wrestled with the angel and so forth, he was 57. He was probably 37 when he wasn't just a boy on his own, left home, scared to death, when he met God at Bethel. But we see God's work over a long period of time, look at the patience of God. And it took 20 years between, first of all, getting him to Bethel. Bethel is house of God. The second place where the angel wrestled with him is called face of God. He said, I've seen God face to face. Notice the progress. This is the house of God. This is the face of God. I've seen God up close. That's two Watershed, crisis, why in the road experiences in our lives. Abraham too. Abraham had two of those that are recorded. Jacob had two. The whole nation of Israel had two. The Red Sea and the crossing of the Jordan River. What does that tell us? There are, God's whole plan of salvation is two specific, distinguished, different Touches from God. One to usher us into his household, new birth. The other 
When he, as Jacob later referred back to that wrestling match, he said, he redeemed me, the angel redeemed me from all evil in here. He cleaned out the deceit that was in here, the self-centered scheming. He got rid of it. That's God's aim. I probably should quit, but I will throw a couple more things in here real quick. <clears throat> Notice the human traits that are involved that require what God does. What God has to do involves affliction, adversity. Jacob had a lot of it. Before I was afflicted, the psalmist said, I went astray, but now I've turned my feet to your testimonies. Affliction, Jacob especially, required it. Before he finally got to where he said, okay, the, the, God spent, if, if he was, 57, when the angel wrestled, God spent over half a century to get one guy to say, my name's Jacob, this is what's in my heart. And he'll do that with every single solitary one of us till he gets us there. Infinite patience. But our dispositions seem to require it. Not only affliction, but blessing. Jacob admitted, man, God, you've been awful good to me. Yeah, he yeah. had. And that even makes this worse. Notice too, why do we require affliction in all God's process? Because of our hesitancy, deep hesitancy to ever acknowledge our need. I mentioned I'll just finish with this. Denial is where we, we live in. Rebecca said, oh, I don't have anything to do with this, Jacob. You, you're the one that did it to Esau. When Esau got robbed and tricked out of the blessing, what did Esau say? You know what? I had it coming. Because I was so unreligious and so uncaring about the things of God that I traded away my birthright which was the that's the union card to give me the right to the blessing I don't get the blessing because I traded away back when, when I traded away my birthright I got it coming did he say that? no he's bawling and carrying on with Isaac and he says my brother stole my birthright and he stole my blessing these two times he's tricked me he can get tricked. He knew what he was doing when he traded away the new birth for a bowl of soup. He didn't get tricked. Is he going to say that? Of course not. No. This is why God has to take so long, and He is He never quits till He gets us to this point where we are, okay, Lord, you see right straight through me. I admit it. Make me different. He did, and he will. Let's bow our heads. We will not close with music, because I may face the music. Take this to heart. God put it in there for a reason. Father in heaven, help us not be tricked by our own intelligence today or by the devil, but as you convict us, as you open up our eyes and our hearts this morning as we listen to that story out of your word, help us to be honest with you. Help us to, no matter where we're at in our spiritual walk, Lord, help us to open our palms of our hands, confess our name, allow you to make us a new creature in Christ and grow us as you see. Father, just help us to be obedient to what you've laid on our hearts this morning through this story so we could have a closer walk with you in all that we do. And we would leave this place with um, clarity of thought and mind, but comfort in our hearts and assurance knowing that we met with you here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.